to Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is episode 33. Uh, we have Jacqueline Samuda on for this episode, and I appreciate uh, you tuning in for our program. Uh, we just finished with David Hewlett, and he was marvelous, and thank you all for joining for that particular show. Uh, special thanks to my uh, mod team, Summer, Ian, Tracy, Keith, and Jeremy. You guys are making this happen uh, to uh Linda Gate Gabber Fury and Jennifer Curry Kirby, my uh, associates. Uh, I could not get this show done uh, or out without you guys. So thank you so much. Before we bring in Jacqueline, uh, just to uh, invite you to. Uh, Share this show on YouTube. If you want more Stargate content uh, like this, it would mean a great deal to me. If you click that like button, it makes a big difference with YouTube's algorithm and will definitely help the show grow its audience. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. Giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops and you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes. This is key if you plan on watching live. And clips from this live stream will be appearing over the course of the next several uh, days and weeks on both the Dial the Gate and GateWorld.net YouTube channels. Thank you again for joining me. And without further ado, Ms. Jacqueline Samuda, Nirti. Hello. Hello. Good to be here. Hello. Where are you? It's so beautiful. Yes, I am in Whistler, Canada. It's just an hour and a half north of Vancouver, where I live. And Whistler, you may know, was the host of the 2010 Winter Olympics. Yes. My father-in-law has a home here. Because of restrictions, we can't be in the space together. But me and my husband, my two children, we're all here for the holidays. Wow, absolutely lovely. And you were, you were mentioning that these, these are antique ornaments, you said? Yes, these are from um, my father-in-law's lady friend. And she has a beautiful stack of these gorgeous little glass ornaments with the glitter like the, the stuff that you haven't seen since the 70s i'm just so excited to use them it's, yeah. it's so so cool to have have you on jacqueline and thank you for sharing that um so how are uh, how are things going in this brave new world <laughs> Yeah, you know, life is different, isn't it? It's it's one of those things where we're all, I think, learning to adapt. We're all, you know, figuring out how to make the most of our homes and mm. use absolutely everything. And it's one of those things where I certainly feel blessed to have a space where I have, you know, adequate indoor space, some outdoor space and over the summer when we were kind of restricted to our homes. And at least we had some garden area and so on. So really feeling fortunate and understanding too that a lot of people are you know are, are more confined and it's it's such a challenge but you know we have to do what we have to do um you know if this was a near tea invented virus she would be very pleased with the progress because it's really been going nuts boy i didn't even think about that that's that's a a, a fair point yeah uh, she would be having a field day right now wouldn't she but I'm lucky because I've been for years doing certain voice work at home. So I had all of my voice equipment and I was accustomed to doing remote recording for voice jobs. And then I just had to adapt with some equipment and just kind of getting my head around doing um, on camera auditions at home. So that was a bit more of a bit more of a challenge, a bit of a learning curve. And there have been hiccups. So it's amazing how just working with technology can contribute to stress and if you're a performer and you're thinking, okay, I just want to concentrate on my character, but my Zoom doesn't want to cooperate and it's a callback and there's a whole bunch of executive producers and a showrunner and you're just like chewing your nails. And it's just, but on the other hand, it's good exercise. Like That's I feel... <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's it's an interesting barrier to entry right now because if if you don't, for so many of us, and especially with our kids and everything else, if you don't have you know the right the right tools to get access to things like Zoom and you know these other, for the time being, it's what we've got, and yeah. we've all got to kind of got to kind of suck it up and just work with it. That like you were saying with voice acting, those people who are already doing voice acting from home, they're set, you know, because that's a lot of that stuff we can continue to to hammer out because. You know, it's all, it's all you, I mean, ideally everyone would, would want to work collaboratively together in person, but a lot of that stuff you can do from home anyway. So. Yeah. I think some of these adaptations that we've made are going to, are going to stick. Like why send everybody to a casting facility when, if you have decent equipment, you can actually send the equivalent quality of audition from your own home. So, 
you know, you do miss certain things though. If, if, they're, if you're not in the presence of the producer or someone who's going to give you direction, you're really having to rely on yourself and, and just do more work yourself. But as I say, I think, you know, I, I feel like it's actually kind of gotten me in better shape. In yeah, a way. that's fair. And I, the thing that I really appreciate about this year, um, if, if, because I think it's important to count our blessings wherever we can, is for those of us who are self-starters, it's really given us uh, uh, new opportunities if we're willing to look for it, you know, yeah. as opposed to those who are like, I, I, I've been talking with so many people who are like, my kids, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're back in school now. It's, it's a, lot, a lot of the, the kids in my neighbor areas are back in school and, and like they have special systems set up. But while they were at home, it was terrible. And now that they're back in class, now that it's structured, it's working again. But for those of them who are self-starters, you know, they're way ahead of the game anyway. Yeah. Yeah, and adults yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, we're getting through it. We're all getting through it. We're doing, we're doing our best. And I'm, I'm just also, just lately, I don't know why. Um, I'm just being reminded that we have to keep practicing patience. And I've, my patience has failed just dealing with just all the restrictions and tax issues and all of that kind of stuff. And just in the last little while, I'm making a conscious effort to remember to be patient, not just with others, with my kids, but with myself mm. and realizing that, you know, the, it's not surprising that some of us might feel low or just a bit sluggish or, you know, we're all kind of, we're kind of living through something very big. It's going to be in the history books. This is not, this is not a drill. Exactly. You grew up in both the U S and Canada. Is that right? Tell us a little bit about uh, your formative years. This is a show where, um, you know, we're, we're not only uh, reconnecting with a lot of the cast and the crew that made uh, the franchise, but we're, this is a show about heroes. And this is a show about the, the people who have uh, helped us to become who we've become. Tell us about uh, where you're, uh, first, uh, first of all, where uh, you're from and how that, uh, how that changed you. Well, I'm, I'm Canadian born. I was born in Ottawa, but I only lived there for the first few months of my life. And then Vancouver, where I lived until I was five or six years old. And then because I'm one of eight kids, just the three youngest kids then continued moving around with uh, my family. My dad was a professor. So we moved from Vancouver to California and we lived in Palo Alto and the area around Stanford. And then when I was nine, we moved to New Jersey in the area, Hopewell, or in the area around Princeton. And New Jersey was incredible. It was, um, it was kind of like living in the country, even though we were close to urban centers. We lived on a sort of a bigger kind of property with lots of trees and tons of wildlife, deer mm -hmm. coming through the yard, glacial rock formations in the woods behind us. And, I used to, like, we were compelled to go outside. There were, there were no options. We were made to go outside as kids. And so for me, that was very creative time because I would make sure that I did something artistic or creative every single day. Walk through the woods, write a song for the flute, which I was learning at oh. nine. I'd write a poem or draw a picture and all that kind of stuff and just and just write. So I, I think that just honestly incredibly long walks in the woods where you were the only person was formative. It was so dense and not particularly traveled that I would do the classic thing of breaking twigs so you could find your way home. <laughs> yeah, just I'm boiling hot. I'm going to take off my- No, my you're good. <laughs> and I still remember one day walking through the woods, getting lost for a little bit and coming upon a path that was as wide as a road, but it was a horse path and the trees were like bowers over it. And then there was an open field and there was a girl galloping a horse through a field. Like it, it honestly, I felt like I'd gone into Narnia. <laughs> <laughs> I found the lamppost. Yeah, I managed to find my way home, find my little broken twigs. And so that was a really incredible place to live and, and good education too. And then, so then at the age of uh, 13, I guess 14, I moved to back to Canada, Kingston, Ontario, where Queen's University is located. And I was there, you know, through my university years, I basically moved to Toronto, just outside of Toronto for university, where I met Brad Wright and my theater program. And, uh, and then after that, I kind of still split my time between the States and Canada. I moved to New York for a few years. And then I moved to back to Toronto 
And then I moved to Los Angeles for eight years. And then when I was trying to decide where to continue my career pursuits, I was in my 30s and I, I just took a car trip and I drove across the US and up to Toronto and I spent a month there and then I drove across Canada and spent uh, a month in Vancouver and then went back to California and within a short amount of time I decided okay yeah Vancouver's for me and and I still had like all my sisters were here so it was like coming home in a way even though I hadn't lived here in years and years it's a it's an amazing city you know, there's so much there. There's the, the, the people are so wonderful. And, you know, you only drive, you don't, you don't have to drive too far before you're in just wilderness. That's right. Yeah, it's amazing. And that's why there's so much shooting here, too, because you can be in a city, a gorgeous city, a kind of a marine setting, lots of coastlines. Then you can be in a rainforest. Not very far from here, there's actually an arid area that's more like deserts. You know, so a show like Stargate was able to take advantage of all of those. Be in the mountains, be in the snow. I mean, just an absolute plethora, every possible kind of of environment, and just really healthy too. Really healthy. A lot of rain, but otherwise. <laughs> oh come on, you gotta love rain. I live in a place where it rains like three days a year. <laughs> so, I'm in Phoenix. Yeah. Oh, in so. Okay. All yeah. right. But I miss my. I'm from St. Louis, so I really miss my rain, and it's like. You know, but when it dumps, it dumps. So anyway, who are your um, personal and professional uh, heroes? Who are the, the people who helped to shape you? Well, I, I can say that I, when I was three, I wanted to be Shirley Temple. <laughs> so that was a bit of inspiration, even though, you know, I just thought she was just so incredible to be able to sing, dance, act. And she was a little like me, you know, in the movies that I saw. So... So that was incredible. And then honestly, the um, when I went to university at the age of 17, my class and my instructors there were absolutely critical to, to my growth as a person and also as a performer. Because when you're in a theater school, it's kind of like being in group therapy in a way. You really are, you are, you encounter yourself and you encounter other people on a very intimate level because you you're being asked to strip down to the basics you know emotionally to be available and struggles are called out your flaws your by flaws I just mean like where you have resistance to doing certain things you have to kind of become vulnerable and open and Ron Singer was a, a very important instructor for me and just just that whole kind of to leave university and have a methodology for how to approach acting and in fact the the education was so complete that i felt like it, in, it informed my writing later on as well because as a performer you're asked to create a world and to have an arc and to be able to justify what the character does and and you know these tactics and actions you take are means to an end what is the end what do you want what's underneath and all of that stuff actually is critical when you're creating characters or creating a story as well. So that was all great. And in the last two years of my university career, I was in a class of 14 people and we were so close and we had so much fun and we did such, we did such good work. It was a great, it was a great group and to feel safe and be able to just take chances and yeah, you can explore. You can you can go in creative ways you didn't expect. Exactly. And then immediately out of York University, I apprenticed at the Shaw Festival. So working there and, and watching the work of some really world level stage performers like, you know, Frances. Oh, my goodness. Her last name is escaping me. It'll come to me. Just one of the most incredible women. She was, you know, I think in her 70s at that time. And right. she's say every morning she would get up strip naked and do her hour of stretching and exercise and then her vocal stuff and then when every time she walked on stage she commanded her charisma was incredible david hemblin was one of the directors i worked with there and he was very inspiring and it, you know it just kind of it gave me a great foundation to then move on to back to toronto and start working professionally and then i have to say doing adam mcgoyan's 
movies. I did three of his films and he's a very important Canadian filmmaker and he's, he has a presence on the world scene as well. And to be quite young, like my first feature film at 21 and, and to be again in an environment where you're surrounded by people you really admire. And I was playing this, this nervous little bride who's being interviewed for her wedding video. And I was using kind of techniques that if I were on stage, I knew that the audience would be laughing. And of course it's a film set, but I'm not used to a film set yet. So I've got this kind of heightened tension and I'm kind of waiting for the response. And then they say cut and then everybody breaks out laughing. And I just got this incredible release and I, I learned how to be in a movie and and what the differences were, you know? So, so from very early on, so that was great. It's a different skill set because, well, I mean, A, you're, you're playing for an audience that's there as opposed to being being taped, but your your level of intensity and emoting is, is different because the camera is with you and you're so much more close. You're not projecting to an audience. And you can sometimes spot like on uh, like those Lifetime movies or some of those lower budget uh, uh, programs where they're pulling theater actors uh, for background and everything else. And they're emoting and they're just like, everything's enormous. And it's like, it's, it's two different skill sets. It is. And actually, I wish I could remember which director it was who said this to me. It wasn't someone I was working with at the time, but he said, you just have to check that you don't scare the camera. And I've actually used that a lot, just don't scare the camera. Because if you're doing a very intense role, if you're playing for a, you know, a thousand seat or more house in theater, you can project and you can get really, really messy. If you are working in a feature film, you can also go bigger too. If you're working in TV on smaller format, it's almost like I used to always think a bit think of it like this so theater is just coming all the way through from behind you and through and film is coming from you straight forward tv you just got to be about this <laughs> this deep and i don't know if that makes sense but just that image helps me to not scare the camera <laughs> when you have an intense role to play on tv boy did you have one for stargate so i but before i get to that um can you tell us a little bit about a uh, a role that that I would say stretched you like in ways that you didn't anticipate or didn't even think were possible and was maybe more challenging than how it appeared on the surface? Well, there is one that stands out for me in my university career on stage. Uh, there were a couple of stage performances that will never leave me. The characters will never leave me. Um, but this one was particularly challenging because my whole company of my whole class auditioned for this role. It was, it was supposed to be a man. It was killer's head by Sam Shepard. And it's a seven minute monologue um, where the killer is in the electric chair strapped down with the uh, thing on the head uh -huh. to the electricity through and blindfolded. <clears throat> and seven minute monologue with a one minute silence in the middle. So <laughs> that is, if you didn't have the blindfold on, that would be challenging. But with the blindfold on, you're relying on all of your visceral energy. And I use my eyes a lot. And I, I'm, I'm sure in near tea, I certainly use my eyes a lot. So in this case, I had to use all of my bodily vibrational energy, and especially during that minute of silence, to kind of arrest the attention and keep it and not let that energy flag. So that was really challenging and, and really thrilling to, to have that responsibility and to just kind of go for it. Um, so other theater performances for sure. But recently um, in 2015, I did a show called Ties That Bind where I played a woman who was secretly an abused wife and she's you know, friends with a woman who is a police officer. And slowly the police officer is realizing that her friend seems like you know something's wrong. Mm -hmm. And so the, that was a very complex role because of the internalized shame and the just that battle for survival and also wanting to say something that's buried 
and having that internal conflict. And the reason that was so meaningful for me is because I, I felt great sympathy for women in that position and the ones that can't speak. And so I had an opportunity to speak on behalf of women in that position. So even though that sounds intellectual, it, it translated into an emotional depth for me. And it, it, it was a really, it just meant a lot to me to, to do that role. And, and that was one of those instances where certain energy and, and intensity did come out. Um, and, but it was, it, it was appropriate for the depth of the, of the emergency. I think that it's fascinating to examine uh, a role like that where, you know, I'm me, and in this situation, I would do X, Y, and Z. And I would do X, Y, and Z because, you know, I'm strong or I'm athletic or I'm this or that. But in a role where you examine a character and examine their history and the building blocks that they've had to work with in their particular circumstances of life and say, okay, these are what this person had to deal with and work with and nothing else. How would I approach that if those were the rules and exactly. go? And that's what you have to do. You have to re it's one of the, the brilliant things about acting is getting to re-examine human perspective. Yeah. And you have to, you have to practice and you have to learn how to justify different approaches or results for, for people. Because one of the things that we often see in a show is like, why didn't the person just say something? And, the, you know, and then the whole course of the, of course, the writers are trying to create all these obstacles to make things harder for these people. And if it's not on the page and it's not obvious, you as a performer have to justify it. You know, as much as you want to say it, there's a reason and you're going to find it. And it's got to be a good reason. Otherwise, it's going to look like a lie, you know? Yeah, it's going to come off as, I mean, you, you, I mean, you may have tried uh, you may have tried, but I mean, A, did you try your best? And B, is it going to appear sincere? You know, and if it appears disingenuous, you've lost the audience and they go, that, that sucked. Yeah. So. so I like that, that kind of, I guess you could call it a method of, I, I'm like the voice of this person. If, and, it, and then over time, especially if it's theater and you're doing so many shows or if it's a series over many years, then that person does become you. You do become that person. But, but to begin with, you're speaking on behalf of that person. It's like, it's like as if you had the person who meant more to you than anyone in the whole world, and you are their representative. You, know, you have to fight, fight, fight. So I'm really interested in talking to you about how you cracked Nirti then, a, a, a psychopathic killer who just sees humans as cattle and prey. Uh, before I get there, did you see uh, the feature film in theaters? What was uh, your familiarity with the franchise? I did not see the feature in, in theaters, but I, I did see it shortly after it was made. I loved that movie, loved it. And in fact, it's so funny, it's totally separate from this. My husband suggested that we watch it with the boys. So we were going to do it last night, but anyway, we're going to do it tonight. So I'll see it again for the first time in ages. Wow. I just love the concept. I've always been deeply, deeply fascinated by mythology. When I was 21 and just finished university, finished Shaw Festival, I started a theater company and I was debating about the names and I wanted to be a camel or a pyramid. I was going to be camel's eye. And then I settled on pyramid productions. I've been fascinated with mythology from around the world forever. So, so the movie was awesome to me. I had zero familiarity with the franchise um, when I, when I was cast as near T and we, which is crazy because of course, you know, as I say, I, I did go to school with Brad, but it was shortly after I moved to Vancouver that, um, that I had the audition and I hadn't yet seen the show. So it was kind of, uh, you know, learning on the fly kind of thing. Uh, so, so you get, you get the role and do you immediately go and start looking into mythology or did you just say, oh, you know what? They're making their own interpretation or maybe they said that to you. Just go with what's on the page. What's the approach for you for a character that has um, such historical depth? Yeah. 
Well, I did look up, you know, whatever I could find on Nirti as, you know, this mythological figure. Um, they don't, they didn't give me anything. So, so they didn't tell me to watch Singularity. I didn't they didn't. I didn't watch it. I didn't know anything about that. I hadn't seen any of the previous shows. So the information I had was strictly on the page and, and in the audition process. And when I did the callback, it was between me and two other women. And, uh, and Brad just gave me a note because they, they had said, you know, there is a kind of elevated essence to the goal. You, they're, they're quite theatrical. So, you know, it was kind yeah. of interesting to bring in some of that theater, you know, that way you operate. Um, but yeah, then I was asked to, okay, make it a little less theatrical, just a little more available. And, and then it was just like reading, reading the scene and reading between the lines because so much of what Nirti does is behind the scenes and talked about. And I was like, just let me in there. I just wanted to do it all right in front of everybody. But instead I had to, of course, you know, read it. And the cool thing, though, I will say, because I really watched my episodes and, it, it, it works. Obviously, this show is lightning in a bottle. Oh, like, yeah. that's why it endures and why the incredible fan base is so devoted. There's, there's magic there and, and just a lot of skill and incredible talent. But one of the things with, like, looking at Nirti, as much as, as an actor, of course, I just want more pages. I want more conflict. I want more opportunities to get in trouble and... Um, but I actually quite enjoyed the episodes with the level of suspense that was created because she's talked about. So she's kind of a legend, you know, and then there she is and and gets to do all that, all the fun stuff. How about that costume? That initial costume? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was just. Man. Oh, I, I still remember doing like going into the costume room at the first the first day I went and just feeling so at home because it was just like walking into a big theater company costume room all the tables all the sewers all the patterns everything handmade rendered in muslin first all everything you know racked and oh my gosh and then of course you know working with somebody as gifted as Christine McQuarrie right. and, oh my god and that fabric that was encrusted with semi-precious stones on the front of that bodice and um and that cool skirt and the headdress and then doing the um the hair and makeup test and then i was presented to rda and he approved <laughs> <laughs> he's producer yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah i still remember that being march stood in front of him i'd never met him before and he just nodded very solemnly <laughs> it's good it's good yeah the um it's established in Singularity that uh, she's willing to murder whole civilizations of people and use kids as weapons. Yeah. So that's how do you how do you access a, a personality like that uh, when you're uh, creating the character? Do you just accept that this is how it is with this character? This is just how she does it? Or do you allow yourself to look into why she behaves the way she does? Well, I, I mean, I because she is, there's something kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's it's sort of iconic. Like these Goa'ulds are very iconic. They represent such a mass of history and come on like a storied figure. So I accept that this is her job. She is a scientist. She is the best scientist. And she has a very serious goal. And so it's not even, I wasn't even really thinking of it as a selfish goal. Like, oh, I just want to create the best host for myself. I'm looking for the best that can be done period. And so the ends justify the means. And if time is not a factor, if you can survive for millennia, then you just work on getting better and better. And anybody who's living in this temporal realm, where it's just like, you're just a blip on the screen, mm. collateral damage. So that's, again, it comes back to you have to justify things. And, and this was easy to justify, as long as I didn't 
switch on any empathy. It was all just, you know, as you say, sociopathic, just these are my pieces and I have a very important job to do and you don't understand it. And you, you might be, you might die. I don't know, but I'm going to work. I'm going to do my work. I mean, <laughs> and, you, it. and Oh, she enjoyed it. Absolutely. No. Yeah. I didn't think of it that way because right. She's with the sarcophagus. Yeah. You know, she can watch civilizations rise and fall and continue to perfect across eons. So yeah. if you can do that, if you had that ability, it, it would be all the more reason to look at anyone else who didn't have the, that ability as lesser than you. Yeah, and expendable, but useful, you know? So here you're useful in this way and you're useful in that way and I'm going to use you this way, but it's for a very important goal that I don't need to trouble myself about making sure you're on board, you know, you are a tool to be used. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. For that first episode, uh, you come through the gate with Lord Yu, played by uh, Vince Criste Cristeo, and uh, uh, Cronus, played by uh, Ron Halder, uh, yes. who both appeared later on. All three of you became um, uh, re recurring characters. Uh, and you also uh, had a lot of uh, those scenes with uh, Rick and the puppet Thor. Tell, tell us about shooting that, ep that initial episode. It was, it was great. I, I actually was so impressed with the sets that I was a bit intimidated. It was such a massive, I mean, even if you go to a convention and you see a replica of the Stargate, I mean, that's impressive. When you see it on a huge sound stage, and you, you know, there's just hundreds of people invested in this incredible thing. It's very cool. It's very, and it is intimidating. And so it took me, it took me a little bit, you know, but I, I remember the first instruction of coming through the gate. That was Martin Wood. I, I, that. I, don't know what happened. I can um, see. And it was kind of like you give a little bit of a, not a hop, but you kind of have a physical experience as you're crossing that threshold. I still remember walking down that my and my my favorite of course was I mean I was invisible for part of the fun stuff <laughs> but anything physical in there was was the best absolutely loved it in rite of passage uh Nirti returns to earth and uh she has an opportunity to advance what she has been uh, learning from her advanced humans all along with this uh, particular girl, Cassandra. Tell us about uh, what it was like uh, coming back to that role after two years. I was so excited. I was so excited and I thought it was such a, a cool opportunity. And I love those actors that I worked with, mm. like across the board. From Colleen Renison, who played Cassandra so beautifully, and she's such a gifted performer and singer, which yeah. I'm sure you're aware. Yeah. It's such a pleasure to work with someone who is such a mature performer, even though she was very young. And Terrell is a wonderful actress. And, you know, the fact that she tapped into that mama bear energy, and I love the fact that it was a face off, you know female-ish to female, me being the ish. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that was really, really cool. I When she came into that room where I'm strapped into the chair or we're standing up, I guess, and she's pointing this out at me. The gun. The gun, that's right. Yeah. The intensity and the absolute unwillingness to back down and to compromise everything for the sake of her child, it, you rise to that, you know? And so that is like, that's what you look forward to when you're a performer, to have those face-offs and to, you know, to really meet somebody toe to toe. And the fact that she knew that I'd lied and pretended to do some healing and didn't. And so that was just so satisfying. So sad. I love that scene between the two of you. And I mentioned this at GateCon uh, with you a couple of years ago. You've when she comes in and she points the gun at you, um, and you're, she's like, "Oh, okay, here we go, <laughs> here we go." And I asked you then, and I'll ask you now. The um, 
behind her eyes, she still, you know, sees these beings as lesser. But I think even in that moment, her her respect for Fraser went up even just a little bit just to confront her the way that she did. It's like, okay, you know, I yeah. I, I I disagree with you. I I don't like that you're pointing the gun at me. But wow, you've got cojones. Yes. Did you yes. play it that way? Yes, absolutely. You nailed it. And and the the other element to it was the entertainment value because when you're it's like being in a sandbox when all, when everybody is just sort of fumbling along being human and so anything you're watching is interesting and kind of fun. it's like watching an ant colony. You know you can crush them but oh they're so look at they they're so busy and they work so hard and then when you see this this figure rise up and say I'll take you on it's like okay well, yeah, all right, good for you, you know? So I, yes, absolutely. Did, uh, when, when you walked through at the end of that, uh, uh, the gate in the end of that episode, uh, SG one has let you go, uh, to go and do whatever you're going to do next. Was there an intent at that point that was like, Jacqueline, we'll, ha we'll have you back in the future. Or, or was it like before as, you know, Hey, come what may, you know, hopefully we'll be back, but there's no guarantee. Right. There's never a guarantee. So it, it was certainly my intention. I'm coming back. I, I intend to come back. Um, but I, I love that exchange between RDA and me. And mostly, I think, because Peter Deloise, you know, such a fun and cool director to work with and just so good. And he just gave me lots of permission to, to just really sit in that moment, that exchange, that silent exchange um, between, um, you know, Richard Dean Anderson and myself. And you almost feel like it, when you're a guest on a show and the stars are, you know, they're everything, the entire weight and success and whatever of the show rests on them. So when you come in as a guest, you know, you want to mind your P's and Q's and you don't want to whatever, maybe take up too much space. Sometimes Peter was just like milk it, just milk it and boy that's fun and and the fact that you know rick was so happy to be present and have that moment so it was super satisfying that's my favorite moment actually he has he has a good time and you know th that's the thing about the tone that brad and jonathan and robert that those guys really set on that uh, franchise was that if we're going to be here, we're going to have a good time. If you're not going to have a good time, might as well go home, you know. But while we're here, we're going to work long, hard hours, and we're going to do great work. And it showed itself. Yeah. Absolutely. It, it, I have to say, like, those sets, every single time, every single time, it was always fun. Always fun, always the best feeling. And it's really, that really comes from the top down, you know? And I'll say the same thing from my, my seminal experiences in film working with Adam McGoyan, where you walk onto a set where every person appears to be really happy to be there. Nobody's there just for the paycheck. They're feeling fortunate that they're in this space, delivering this work and, and knowing that it's good and that it's, it's appreciated. It's, it's very special because sometimes you, you get on set and, and, you know, it's not always it's, the case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so she goes on to ruin another civilization with her genetic experimentation. What was it like getting to wrap that arc? The first of all, uh, you had someone new to play with corn Nemec and yes. play with him. She did. Uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. So he was he was really really fun. To, that that whole like final scene that you know Peter was shooting through my leg like from um, from the graduate. Yes, exactly right. So so fun. So of course, like having to I co-wrote the story, and I had pitched the idea of the DNA machine, and then it became that was yours. Yes, yes, yes. <sighs> Yeah, so that was integrated into the larger story. And then um, James Titchener wrote the, the screenplay. And of course, Brad always contributed. And um, so did I want to die in the episode where I also had a writing credit? Not necessarily. But on the other hand, 
when you're, you know, when you're a gold, who's to say that you don't have a clone or you got something going on there, you're going to come back in some way. So, so I was definitely um, not feeling like my, my death had to be eternal forever and ever. Amen. But I, I did like coming back and bringing all of that work, that devious, evil, meddling work and bring it home to the SG1 team. Because then it's like it's like it's like the the best possible end of an arc for any villain. Like if you think of a movie, it's always going to be mano a mano at the end, and the bad guy has to face off with, you know. So now there I am, actually facing off with Amanda's Carter and you know Corn's character and RDA, and and so that it, you it, you almost have to have that. So that was very satisfying. I loved doing that bit with Amanda. That was so cool. Yeah. He's incredible. Um, you know, I mean, what can you say? And that whole thing with Corin, like the fact, the fact that Peter, he's just such a clever director and he's so um, efficient. So he was doing most of that scene just with our faces kind of right here. And of course, as an actor, I wanted to be looking right in Corin's eyes and doing all this kind of stuff. But then when you watch it, it it's got a really interesting quality. You know, and it is it is creepier in a way just to be kind of hovering and be right against his cheek. And that whole that little chalice that we that I was drinking from. And yes, I, I think that was sold at an auction. It was yeah. sold my very first my very first convention in Blackpool, England. And Corin was there and he and I did the bidding for that. We did the auction for that. And it raised like eight hundred euros or something ridiculous right easy amount for charity right so that was so so great yeah one of the things that has always been a cornerstone of stargate is that actions have consequences and that when you um agree to get something from someone that you uh that that is it that is a foe and in this particular situation, the agreement is releasing that foe back into the cosmos. SG-1 is responsible for what happened to those people in uh, in your last in your last show, Metamorphosis. Uh, that's that's some pretty pretty heavy subject matter, and they they don't um, they don't get away with it. The that that race no, lets them know, you know, you are responsible for this. Yeah. And actually, that's a very good point because I think it's Wodan who does the final, like, yeah. telling of me. And what? Yeah, yeah, right? Jeez. <laughs> and he he knows that. So it's like, why why is he going to serve you and keep her alive for your purposes when when she's done all this devastation? And Dion Johnstone, who plays that, is is such an important actor. And he also was in that episode of Ties That Bind that I saw. Oh, Really? About. He was one of the lead series leads where he played a, a police officer. Just so fabulous to work with him again. And Alex Sahara, who played the psychic character, who mm. was able to tell Wodan, you know, she did this and blah, 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 and it's true. Those guys, like the fact that they were able to work with those prosthetics and, and, and still manage to communicate as performers, I mean, that's a special, special level of skill. There's a, that's one of the things I wanted to get to was, was the pros, the prosthetics in that episode. I mean, they, we've, we've seen a lot of alien creatures and, um, uh, other, other forms of life, but I mean, people, uh, that they, uh, that they make themselves out to be in this, in this particular episode, there are people who have lived like that and, and those are the bodies that they've had. And so what was it like staring into a lot of those, uh, those prosthetic suit that I mean through the screen they just look so real I mean you could the, the that's just magic that's movie magic absolutely like it it's it's horrifying you know it's horrifying and the fact that they those characters had this sweet terrible belief that they were getting treatments to help them and really they're just continually being experimented on and I look at them and I'm like Come on, near to you. <laughs> do a little better than this. I mean, they had incredible skills, telekinesis and psychic abilities and so on. But at what on. cost? At what cost? Exactly. Exactly. And actually, that's a very big question, isn't it? I mean, in science in general, there's always that 
that weighing of, of the good with the bad and w- how can you justify that kind of thing? Yeah. That our, w- our history is, includes, you know, times where we have experimented and tried to perfect our own species. And it's just horrifying, but to do it to a race that didn't ask for it, I mean, is, is, a, is even on an, on an order beyond that, you know, they had no choice. They were subjects. Yep. They were subjects. They were victims. They were prisoners. They were, they had no options whatsoever. And they, you know, they were almost like also cult followers too, yeah. because they made the mistake of believing the lie. And I have to say like that whole, just rewatching all the material with, you know, with Cassandra and Rite of Passage and then the whole situation of metamorphosis and being in a pandemic environment you know where they're talking about this particular virus and where did it come from and oh gosh yesterday i went down a rabbit hole and i was watching ancient aliens and they were talking about like viruses from outer space and i was like i'm kind of ringing a bell yeah we're pretty vulnerable (laughs) when it gets right down to it and i think uh i think uh really in recent times that's that's crystal clear so and what a great costume for this uh new episode as well did you have any input no, I had no input. I just, honestly, I mean, it gets pretty low cut and, and, you know, there are moments where I'm like, just sort of doing this and arranging myself or whatever. And then I realize I'm still on camera, but in between takes and the whole video village is kind of walking away. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, what else are you going to get it done? You know, you gotta, you gotta adjust sometimes. Yeah, so you can use the camera lens as a mirror in between takes, but you have to remember that there's still people sitting and watching the feed, you know? So, I mean, I just I just went with it. Because when you, they were just geniuses. The, those costumiers are just like so incredibly gifted. And yes, it was a bit revealing, but hey, man, I was nerdy. I didn't care. I was dirty, flirty, nerdy, as RDA used to call me. <laughs> I did. <laughs> That's yeah. That's, Dirty flirt. that's just great. Uh, I so you so it wasn't your intent to have the character die. Who's who said you know what? At this point, we need to add this. It's it's well, time because there was a chance that there wasn't going to be in the six season six sci fi channel. They were going to end it. That was it. Wow. Hey, imagine. Right. So I don't know whose decision that was exactly, but you know when when they're crafting a show like this they are looking at large arcs and they do need their characters to have these massively impactful moments and obviously that was a critical episode for the dr fraser character and you know and others um with with rite of passage and has to have some kind of end you know the fact that i did these horrible things and our guys are heroes the sg1 team they are heroes and they have to win the battles in in a massive way it can't just be letting me go back through the stargate every single time i do something naughty you know eventually it has to be a reckoning and and then move on and that's why it was it was a pleasure to be able to come back because there wasn't an expectation but always just you know the hope and the the glee when it when it did happen for sure i think that it's interesting that sg1 isn't the aren't the ones that break her neck you know, she's she has tampered with people's lives. They encourage people, the people to do X, Y or Z. They eventually go and do it and discover just what they've been dealing with. And they yeah. take care of her. I think yeah. that there's a poetic irony in that. Yes, yes, actually. Yeah, thank you. That's so true. So true. And then to come back for Continuum was like, what? Yeah. you know, because I thought I'm dead. OK, I'm coming back in some in some form. This is this is cool and this is exciting. What was that like? What a trip to be gone for so many years. And then from a, a twist of, of time travel, uh, you're, you're back again and in a row of all sorts of heavyweights. I loved it. As always, wanted to do more. I wanted to just get into it with ball and so on. But honestly, first of all, again, the costume. Absolutely, staggeringly gorgeous costume gorgeous wig you you really start to inhabit uh, a being when you're clothed like that the weight of real regal materials were used like just incredible it makes you really get there quickly 
And then walking into that room. Now, of course, everybody's hilarious. They're all so fun. So we're yucking it up. Steve Basic is cracking wise and, you know, but just to be there with Peter Williams again and, you know, with, oh my God, I mean, Cliff Simon and we, we are friends, you know, so I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It and was of course, now, Hathor and Baal and Apophis and Nearty love hanging out at cons together. So we just have such a scream. Like we're really genuinely good friends. Tell us about the convention experience. What is that like from your perspective? It's, it's, um, it's super fun. Like from the, from the very first one that I did in Blackpool where I was the surprise guest and I've told the story many times. I have not heard it. Have it? Oh my goodness. Okay. So I was invited to go and I was told that I was the surprise guest. And I thought at that time I was like, well, surprise guest. I mean, will anybody know who I am? This could be awkward. I don't know. And I was, so I'm in a bus with all these great actors and we go to this green room and I'm, I think it must've been like an airplane hangar. That's how big the venue was. Wow. There were thousands of people there. Wow. A massive stage. They had a replica Stargate that actually did spin. They had smoke and light effects. They had music. I mean, it was like a big time, a big time show. And and I was told, well, all you're going to do is where you're going, actors are just going to walk out one at a time and say who they are and what time is their signing the next day. And I thought, OK, I can do that. <laughs> and then, of course, they start coming out one at a time and they're all stand up comics. You know, uh, J.R. Bourne gets out there and it's like, but I'm bum, but I'm bum. And everyone's laughing. And I'm like, I have no material. I haven't prepared for this. You know, Gary Jones goes out there. Da, 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 da. Everyone's screaming, laughing. That is so true. <laughs> me no one knows that I'm going to be there and I'm I'm told okay so you're the only one who's not just going to walk out on stage you're going to get into the sarcophagus that we have backstage you had a sarcophagus sarcophagus you're going to be in there with a microphone you are going to be pushed through the stargate with the smoke and light effects the sarcophagus lid is going to slide off with the sound effects of heavy stone and then two Jaffa are going to lift you out of the sarcophagus with no introduction. And so I'm like, I was like, oh my God. And this, I, and no one had told me that I was going to do this. I had nothing prepared. I climb into the sarcophagus with my microphone. And I'm like, oh my God, I have no idea what I'm going to say. They push through and there's the sound of this grinding stone and lights and the smoke and the Jafar I don't know, out there somewhere. And then the, the lid comes off and these gigantic men in Jafar costumes lift me out. And everybody recognizes me and they all cheer. And I was like, oh my God. And I said, you know, when I got into that thing, I was a little jet lagged, but there's a mini bar in there and it's a sarcophagus, so I feel kind of fresh. You know, when I was trying to do my little thing, had the best time. And that of course was right in the, the peak, I think of, of all the fans being super excited. So the lineups were incredible. You just really got a, you know, you got sore signing the, the pictures. The excitement was palpable. It was so, so cool. So exciting. And then from then, I, I, I missed a few years. I, I had two babies and, you know, so occasionally I wouldn't be able to attend. There were a couple in Germany I really wanted to do and, and wasn't able to go. Um, but then um, another super memorable uh, con was the, the uh, ones in um, Australia and New Zealand. Mm. So thrilling, like massive, massive cons that just appreciating all kinds of sci-fi and animation and just, you know, really, really huge events. It's the energy and it's the excitement. And then over the years, like considering the first episode that I did, I think was shot 20 years ago, something like that. Yeah. Like a really long time ago. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. And the fact that the devotion of fans is so constant their interest their keenness i love the fact that fans if i ever falter forget something there's always somebody in the crowd who knows the answer who knows nearty's biography perfectly and and it the energy is great and it feels like a family and the fact that the really really loyal fans come back over and over again to conventions so you see them with the joy of kind of you know, reuniting with their pals 
And similarly, that's how I feel when I see my Stargate cast member friends when, when we meet again, wherever it is in the world, wherever it is in Canada or the United States or, you know, Australia, New Zealand or England or, you know, it's, it's just, it doesn't die. I don't, I, it's, it's magic. There really is some kind of alchemical thing that, that has been in, invested in this show by the energies of the right people coming together and the creation that, you know, these creators really did put that lightning in the bottle. Like it didn't happen accidentally. They cast the people, they set the tone and that translated and that joy and that kind of sense of family. You see it when you watch the episodes, you see it with the SG one team, you see it with the guests and the fact that we're always happy to see each other and the fans, we're always happy to see the fans and it's mutual. It's special. I've never experienced that with, with any other show that I've done. Brad made the comment that sci-fi is not one genre. It's all of them. Oh. And it has a transcendent nature to it by the way in which it tells stories. It keeps you coming back for more and gets interpreted again and again across time through different generations, through different lenses. And it all still works because it's human. Yeah, I think that's very interesting and very true because there's definitely soap opera elements, you know, the shipping, but not just that. It's also the family, you know, stuff that happens and you, tra you trace that over seasons and various episodes. So that element is there. There's thriller elements, you know, when certain individuals of the SG-1 team are having to run and evade. And yeah, I think that's really, really interesting. So true. I have uh, a couple of, uh, uh, more than a couple, I have a few uh, uh, fan questions before, before I get to them, though. Uh, you were recently the voice of Captain Marvel in uh, Marvel Superhero Adventures. Tell us about voicing a comic icon. I, super fun, of course. And the audition process was kind of interesting because it came to me like all of mine do. It's just an email put this in, as an MP3, send it to us. And I don't know a lot of the details, you know, I just know, okay, Captain Marvel, that sounds exciting. I'm going to, I'm going to do that. And then that was the first time I was asked to do a callback for an animated character. And I did, I think two callbacks actually. And then when you go into the studio, of course you've got LA is, is on the line and then you've got producers and, and directors in the booth and you're in the booth with, your fellow actors. And I, um, I absolutely love the fact that, of course, it's a, it's a powerful, iconic female uh, superhero, but it's the kids' version. Yeah. So it's got this, uh, I didn't understand that. Yeah, it's got this light and this sweetness. And, you know, my job is to, in, in, that, in the episodes that I've done, is to kind of help Spidey realize that he's brave enough to do certain things that he's feeling a little nervous about. <laughs> so it's kind of this crossover thing where it's, it's the little superheroes, Aww. but you still have, to have that, you know, that gravity. So I, I absolutely loved doing it. Well, the message is, is getting across. I mean, if, if there's any, you know, um, message of superhero films, it's not that you need to wait around for a superhero to rescue you. It's that, you know, you believe in yourself and you can pull pretty much anything off. Yeah. Yeah. You need to try your best. You need to have the support of friends. You need to ask for help when you need it and you need to be brave. And that's, that's kind of a consistent message in those episodes. And I'm, I'm all for all of those messages. So, so I really, I really do love that. Keith Homel uh, said, I was fortunate enough to sit with you at a dinner table at GateCon, and it was great. The dinners are one of my favorite parts of the, the GateCon conventions. Um, any, uh, uh, what, what are the favorite, uh, your favorite parts of conventions where you make guest appearances? I guess you kind of already answered this question with, um, with the, the fan interaction, but uh, any, any other unique memories uh, of meeting fans that stand out to you across time? Well, you know, the last convention that I did in England, um, I had a, I had an injury. So I had, I had torn, well, kind of partly ruptured my Achilles. And it was the week before the convention. And 
So You'll be doing the, a lot of moving around. Yeah, the logical thing would have been to cancel, but there had been one or even two guests that for reasons of work had to cancel at the last minute. Yeah. So I thought, I'm going to go. I, you know, these people are gathering, they're excited. Yeah. You know, there's been a couple of people who can't who can't show up. If I physically can do it, I'm going to do it. Now, it was, there was a little bit of a risk because with an injury, when you fly on a plane, you know, you have to get up and move around or, you, you know, you run the risk of a little bit of a problem. But I don't know how we did it, but it was almost like everybody worked together and it, it included fans um, kind of rallying to help me because I couldn't walk. So <laughs> we... We had the loan of um, Erica's wheelchair. Erica, if you're watching, I appreciate it so much. We all signed the bottom of her wheelchair <laughs> at the end of it. And, you know, it, to my great good fortune, you know, there was also Peter Williams and Cliff Simon and, and Sue Ann Braun there too. So it was kind of like the gang's all here as well as some Absolutely. other people. And, but the fact that the fans were so kind and warm and helpful like they it was like I was an Egyptian goddess because people would carry me they would make way for me they were so considerate I mean, it just warmed my heart like I see the pictures and sometimes you can't tell that I'm a, I'm always the only one seated or whatever or that I'm being wheeled around in, in a wheelchair but we we just all made it work because we were all there for the same reason to enjoy being together and celebrating a show that we all love to pieces. So that, that's going to be, you know, just a top, top memory for sure. For sure. You're and, you, so go, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. You, you are surrounded by people who are delighted to have you and, you know, who care about your best interests and, and you know, want to make sure that you're going to be, that you're going to get through it. All right. So it's really the best environment to be in as a fan convention. Yeah, like real, real humanity, real humanity. And I just, I love those moments where you, you actually have a, a you have, a, you have time to have a conversation with a fan, like at those dinners, like, cause you can't always have like a more than a few words because if there's other people waiting, you know, you don't want to, you know, take too long, but I, I, you know, there's just peak moments through, all of the years, all of the years. One of my favorite memories, this, this doesn't involve a fan particularly, but then he said he was a fan. So that was really, was really cool was um, when I was doing the convention in Australia and I was in the green room and I needed a pair of scissors because I had some thread or something like that. And so I was walking through to, through a, down a hallway in the, but in the actor's area and I'm, I pass these guys and I hadn't seen the movie yet, but they're dressed as vampires from what we do in the shadows. And I, there Great were film. makeup people. And so I just said, does, does anyone have scissors? And then this very ghoulish vampire turns to me and says, I have scissors. And it was Ben French. And I said, Oh, thank you so much. Uh, hi, I'm Jacqueline Smith. And he, and he said, I know who you are. And I was like, this incredible vampire knows who I am. <laughs> it's so fun. And now we're, we're like pals on Twitter and you know, it's, it's good. It's good. You never know who you're going to meet. You know, you never know who you're going to cross paths with and, and what's, what fun you're going to have. So well, once we're all out of this, go to a convention. It's, it's, it needs to be the top of everyone's list. Cause you're just going to feel so much better. Sure. So. <laughs> Reno, uh, your favorite costume. Oh, my favorite costume. Well, of course, that bodice with the encrusted with the semi-precious stones was absolutely stand out. I, I quite loved in Metamorphosis that that bodice, obviously, it was very revealing, but then it had that little mesh piece that comes down over the navel. I mean, I felt sexy. Like, I, I, I really looks kinda, great. <laughs> I kind of loved it. You know, I, I really did. But I will say, you know, Continuum. That costume, I did actually ask if I could have the muslin rendering. Like, can I please have the costume in the plain white cotton? Not understanding, of course, when they said, no, oh, sorry, we can't. Well, the reason is they make the costume and then they pull it apart to use as the pattern. Oh. Incredibly expensive material. So they make it once, fit it on you, 
and then they take it apart and and recreate it in the actual fabrics so that's how important that costume was to me i was like this is the most spectacular thing i've ever seen that the combination of the wig and the headdress and the whole thing Continuum had a little bit more money, obviously, because it was a DVD movie. But at the same time, we're historically showing each of these characters over the course of the run. And you know, the costume really w was all so much a part of the gold's identity. And at the end of SG-1, that's the time to do it. Just, yeah. just pull out all the stops and make everyone look spectacular. Absolutely. Ron Halder, all of his, his big pieces and his wool. I mean, not wool, but like it looked like an animal that he was wearing. It was just amazing. And, and, and you, I loved your costume as well. Thank so you. It was so cool. Uh, let me yeah. say, rest in peace, Ron Halder, because he was such a gifted, lovely. He's passed? Yeah, a few years ago. Few I years did ago. not know that. Such a, such a lovely man and a great actor. Mm -hmm. ah, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, yes, absolutely. May he rest in peace. Teresa, uh, speaking of outfits and revealing things, do you have a regular fitness program? You look so uh, great. Oh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. I've changed over the years, but I, I was a bit of an athlete as a high school person. I was uh, an oars woman, and I had, I'd actually been accepted onto the Canadian national youth team for rowing, but because I knew that I wanted to act, I was quite muscular and I thought I better stop this now or I'm never going to get cast as a normal person, <laughs> just so muscular. So once I went through university, then I was doing a lot of dance and, you know, I would just do kind of regular gym, gym rat stuff. Like, you know, um, I did some weights and always lots and lots of stretching. And then after um, I moved back to Vancouver from, from, California, I, it was mostly yoga. So now I'm doing, it's mostly yoga and kind of a dance fitness. And I do the dance fitness when I'm not in the mood to exercise because it cracks me up. I just, <laughs> <laughs> I laugh as I'm like doing my little, you know, it's kind of like a Zumba thing. So yeah, but the main thing for me is just to keep moving and, uh, you know, get some cardio and yoga is is great. It's it's been sad not to be able to do yoga for some months because of restrictions. So I do some at home, but um, but I I love doing hot yoga, and I also like infrared saunas. They're awesome. Really, infrared saunas. Infrared saunas because it that helps to jumpstart your metabolism if your metabolism feels switched off. And after having kids, that happened to me for sure. Yeah. And. It also helps with inflammation and I have injuries from sports and from a couple of car accidents. So when those things start to feel creaky or whatever, getting in the infrared sauna regularly, it just fixes you right up. At least that's wow. been my myself. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Hey, that's, that's, that's cool. And whatever works, you know, I mean, if that's, if that's the way I, I didn't, I thought that yoga was always a solitary experience. I guess that there's group yoga classes now that I think about it. Yeah, lots of them. And so I, I like doing um, the group hot yoga and it really helps because it's 90 minutes and it's extremely demanding. So when you're in a room where nobody quits and nobody leaves the room and when I say nobody quits, sometimes it's hard enough that you have to take a minute. Yeah. You don't leave the room, you stay with it. Yeah, you're still invested in it. Totally. And then if you're doing, you know, just kind of a flow yoga or a power yoga and you're in a group, it's almost like if you have the experience of singing in a choir or playing an instrument in a band and you get with a groove, you can actually have that sometimes in a class where everybody's moving simultaneously and it becomes kind of an energetic experience. There's an it uplift. Really is. Absolutely. And then the breathing mm. really settle your mind. So I, I'm definitely missing that because I've, you know, we're all getting a bit of your crazy energy. Oh my gosh, yeah. Well, I think we've all gained, you know. I certainly have put on some pounds, let me tell you, Jacqueline. So <laughs> <laughs> Stephen wanted to know, good evening from Hartpool in, in Northeast England. Any pranks on the other cast members? Or was uh, it all business? Oh, well, no, it definitely wasn't all business. I didn't play any pranks. I'm there as a guest. I'm yeah. a polite guest. But it's super fun to be around these absolute maniacs that are like Chris Judge and Michael Franks and, and RDA. I mean, I've, this is another story I've told where 
I don't know why, but for some reason, I guess people had dogs on the set, so yeah. they had sweets on the snack table. And Richard Dean Anderson and Michael Shanks started kind of daring each other to eat them. And then I guess they decided they liked them, so they would walk around eating these dog biscuits. <laughs> and right before a take uh, one time, Artie looks at me and he goes, what do I have in my pocket? And I said, a dog biscuit. He was like, how did you know that? And I was like, you've been eating them all day. Yeah. yeah. And then I remember this, this wasn't on set, but it was, um, it was when I arrived in, was this in Australia? No, this was in England. So I had a convention in England and I had just, it was that first one, the very first one. So I think I had done the whole sarcophagus entrance thing. And now I'm going back to my room and I'm changing and I'm kind of getting ready for bed. And there's a bang on my door and it's J.R. Bourne and Chris Judge dragging me out for drinks. And there was no saying no. <laughs> it was a like, year coming. We're going down to the bar and we're going to have some drinks. Ah. You know, so they, they definitely had tons of that energy. <laughs> you, so, yeah. you know, yeah. There, th these convention experiences they bring fans together. They bring they bring the actors together, and we we as fans we don't uh, we don't appreciate just how much camaraderie there is between all of you, as well. Yeah. At least I don't. You know, when I'm there, it took me a while to realize. You know, uh, uh, just how much you all loved being together and needed your space as well. Because as an entertainment journalist, I'm backstage, you know, wanting to get some content for online and everywhere else, you know, you guys need time too. You know, you, you guys need some time to catch up. Yeah. And as an example, um, the last convention that I did in Telford and um, so Peter Williams and Sue Ann Braun and Cliff Simon and I, we all had one evening where we weren't booked. And so there was, you know, it's a small community, but there was one sort of um, recognized restaurant that it was in a beautiful setting. It was in a, a decommissioned church or something like that. It was just spectacular. So we all go out, we have dinner together. And I swear, it's like we are family. We're laughing. We're having the best time. Of course, we drink a couple of bottles of wine. I'm Everyone's in a, a little loose. You're what now? Yes. I'm in a wheelchair, right? <laughs> so... So I had my crutches in the restaurant. We get back and then they're wheeling me back to my room. And some videos were posted online. I'm sure you can find them on, on Sue Ann's uh, Twitter or her Instagram. And, you know, certainly no disrespect meant to anybody who, who is in a wheelchair, you know, as a regular condition. But we started just improvising and being naughty in the hotel hallway. Peter had gone into his room already and, and then Sue Ann and Cliff just started pretending they were like just these bizarre, hilarious characters. And we were just so naughty. I don't know how we woke no one up. We woke nobody up. I have not laughed so hard. And then when I finally go into my room and they both go into their room and then I just opened my door <laughs> To just I don't know check on the wheelchair or something because it had to sit outside my door and I open my door and I look down the hallway and Cliff has opened his door and he's looking down the hallway we both look at each other at the same time because what he had wanted to do was to sneak down the hallway and just be sitting in the wheelchair for, for when I opened my door just to freak me out and scare me <laughs> he started laughing and even when we left the next day so I'm going one way, and I guess they were going on a later flight to a different destination. So I'm staying in a hotel near the airport, and I've just arrived, and they're continuing to make funny videos and sending them to me. And so I'm sitting in the hotel lobby. I mean, I'm laughing till I am crying. It is just, oh, my God. When you have really funny, good actors and you get to hang out with them, I mean. It's a party. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Kyle wanted to know, uh, given how she escaped several times before, how do you feel about Nirti's ultimate fate? It's pretty fitting. Yeah, it is. It's fitting, but I, I would have loved to be able to activate my rings and disappear before that happened and go somewhere else and then come back and wreak lots more havoc. I just, yeah. I, 
wanted to keep coming back. I, I felt like I had so much more to do, which I'm sure would be exactly Nirti's thought process. She would feel like it's too soon. Yeah. <laughs> too close, you know? So yeah, so fitting, but as an actor, man, I wanted to do more. And as a character, Nirti had lots to do yet. So so you, you contributed to Metamorphosis. What, uh, Kevin Leach, what inspired you uh, to add the DNA machine and, and do those other components to that, uh, to the contribution to that story? Well, at the time I was, I think I was teaching screenwriting at Vancouver film school. And I was working a lot as a story editor where you, you work as you kind of advise on flaws or things that have to be addressed in screenplays. So I was working production companies and government agencies to do that. And I was, I was ready to start generating some of my own, um, scripts or more of my own scripts and so I had been asked to pitch actually to Andromeda to Alan Eastman so I had developed this whole pitch that included this DNA machine and it didn't go anywhere with Andromeda so then one day um, I just said to Brad we we decided we were going to have lunch and I said you know I have an idea I'd like to kind of run it by you and so we have a nice lunch and I tell him this whole concept of this DNA machine and there were more to it obviously and he said you know that's interesting let me just take that into the room and see what happens and as these things go it takes time you know so it was kind of thrown into the pot like certain moments or concepts that one stuck Mm. and it kind of gelled with another idea that was already developing so they decided to integrate it. And so Brad called me and said, you're going to have a, a story credit. I was super excited. Of course, I wanted to write the whole script. But James, of course. Yeah, you know, but anyway, it was James's time to, to do that. Yeah. And so well, it's, you're the villain. You're, you're, it's your story for all intents and purposes. Yeah, but I hadn't pitched that it was Nirti's machine. So that was interesting. I personally am interested in um, quantum physics and biomechanics and I'm just interested in science as a human being um, even though to be honest I haven't watched a whole ton of sci-fi weirdly but I love thinking about it in the real world so it I was just so fascinated and the whole concept the visuals of of the way DNA looks and functions I just felt it was so it could be so mechanical and so interesting almost like a, a place you can go into and so that was just it was it was the idea of it it was the concept and it was the visual appeal of it too that was kind of in the uh, in the pitch and then of course it made perfect sense for near made perfect sense for her yeah to be able to alter people's genes on the fly so the end product that we saw was that pretty close to what you had in mind? Well, yes and no. The fact that, you know, when you see Amanda, for example, and she's, she's standing on a platform and that DNA is going around her. Yes. But my original visual was more of the person almost like climbing the stairs of the DNA. Of the helix. Yeah. Yeah. I may still use that somewhere else. Yeah, that is to- that is totally legit. Wow, very cool. Um, uh, well, Claire Burr, what is your favorite um, prop that you got to use uh, in the show? There were there were a couple that you got to use. Yeah, there were some cool ones. The healing device I, was cool. Yeah, I like the healing device. That that I would say that was my favorite. That was my favorite, and kind of, you know. When I, when I actually did do the healing on Cassandra and I had that second device, I don't know what that one was called. Do you know what that spider one was called? Uh, I, I, they reused it again a few years later. I actually, right um, right here is uh, one of your devices as well. Hey. Now that I now that I realize it. So yeah, I've got a little near tea in my back behind it. It didn't even recur, occur to me until now. So yeah, but it didn't have technically a name. Right, just, right. just the healing okay. device did. Those two, those two devices that I used in concert when I was working with Cassandra, that was really cool. And I'm, I'm actually interested in healing, in metaphysical healing. So it, uh, that was kind of just, it worked for me. I could imagine your energy kind of using, going through these devices, magnifying the, the technology and the technology using your energy to function. That made sense to me. So I really enjoyed those. Very cool. Yeah, that I think that there is more. 
I, I don't think that pills solve everything. I think that there's more going on. The EM spectrum is pretty huge. We're tied into some more stuff than I think that we realize yet. And so that, that aspect of Stargate always uh, lent credence to that idea that there's yeah. there, there, I suspect there may be a, a, a real thing like, like, like energy transference to heal. Yeah. I like thinking about things like that. Do you think, uh, Zader, do you think part of Nirti's success as a villain was because unlike other gold, she relied almost entirely on um, uh, her own knowledge, uh, her own power and her own subterfuge? Yes, 100%. As soon as that question started, I was like, yep, she is, she's working from the inside out. It's her elevated intelligence and her capacity to create new technology, to picture what's possible, and then to actually have the brilliance to execute and to create technological supports to, to make that happen, to create the result. Even though obviously she tried, she failed, she tried, she failed, she kept working, but nobody else was able to, to use some of the technology that she had. There were no other golds running around with the invisibility, capacity you know only one Hathor but oh, she was knocked off early on and that but that was it no one, no one else had it right I think they may have been in cahoots for a little bit yeah I'd like to see a little bit of Hathor near T kind of thing happen <laughs> <laughs> who knows we could be we could do some damage together I think <laughs> absolutely Sue Ann's uh, show Hathor hosts I think you were on it yes I was isn't I she terrific so good so good like what a what a ray of light like she's so talented she is she's so charismatic she's so fun generous and then to put that show together at a time when it could really just bring a bit of light to people and and just having the kind of personality that she does that she can appeal to you know her fellow performers who just want to share i just really i my hat's off to her and i i had a a an Instagram account that I really wasn't using. Mm. So I actually should give you guys my accounts because I, I would like to. Absolutely. Start. We'll promote. Yeah. So, so for Hathor hosts, I kind of reactivated my Instagram account. So that one is at J E Samuda, all small letters, J E S A M U D A. Okay. And then Twitter is at J Samuda, but the J and the S are both accounts. And I want to up my my game now that we're doing more from home. Absolutely, this is this is our theater now, so this is what we've got. Yeah. I, I will I will add that information to the uh, profile after we're finished. Uh, more Ken. Uh, so when you were initially uh, uh, playing uh, Near T, did you have any uh, character inspirations for her? Did you go a little, you know, pull a little of Hannibal Lecter? Or how how do you as an artist work when you're building a character? Like that. Oh, that's interesting. You know, it's so funny that you said Hannibal Lecter. I just had to audition for something where they said we want a little piece of a piece of Hannibal Lecter. Um, always as an actor, I look at what is the objective of the character? What's my aim? What's my goal? How do I want this show to end in my character's world? And then what tactics, what actions am I going to take to make them happen? And then I have to work with the script and find the moments so that one of my tactics is being executed with each line. And, that the, and then, because it's an evil character, subtext is always critical for any character. There are certain genres where subtext isn't as critical. Like, you know, you can kind of take people at face value in some really poppy, fun shows. Mm -hmm. But especially when you're playing an evil character, Subtext is everything. The chances of you putting all your cards on the table are about nil. So that's the main thing. So it's not like being inspired by another famous character or that. It's more like, what does this character, this character is a scientist. Some people would call her evil because she's willing to use children, human beings, the most nefarious methods to execute her aims. And then that subtext of always having a bit of a secret, always, you know, as I say, watching the ant colony, like there's just something, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of a glimmer uh, behind the eyes. And, and that's just 
it's it's kind of ephemeral. Like it, I, it was a feeling more than uh, an intellectual idea. Just that notion of, isn't this interesting that I'm here with these kind of silly, silly humans and they're not cooperating, but they will. They just don't know it yet or they don't realize they're already cooperating, you know, that kind of stuff and just enjoying it. And then of course, if you have the brilliant makeup and hair and wardrobe, and I mean, I had things like just exotic, exotic things for, for near tea, like the Mendy, the hand painting, which it's, it looks kind of strange actually, when you look at it on the screen, it's like, what's wrong with your hands? But the very first time we put that um, ink the kind of henna on my hands, it was done by an actual Mendy artist and it took a really, really long time. Yeah, it was actually carefully hand painted. And then we realized, okay, that's not practical because already the rest of the stuff takes a long time. So eventually we found stencils, which are commonly used. So we did those and then I was given a makeup pen to kind of reinforce the ink as it kind of would fade over. Yeah, throughout the day. Yeah. And if I was on set for three days that week, then I would just keep it and keep. And so that actually, it becomes like a ritual and it starts to settle you into your character. It's very common for actors to have rituals and they will often do similar things every time because it's an energy work as well as, as anything. Wow. So yeah, those are my That's methods. crazy. That's a lot. And I, I've never... I gotta say, Jacqueline, I've never paid attention to to Near T's hands. I'm gonna go back right. and have a look at it. Yeah, and I think I think possibly at Metamorphosis we might have not done the Mendy. I I can't recall, but certainly if you look back, uh, fair game. When I'm using the the hand device, and it's like, are her hands just really old? Like, they're, what's going on? Is it veins? Like, what is it? And it's this kind of pale orangey brown ink, this henna that I mean. And it's a classic um, Indian kind of makeup that's done on the feet and hands. And it was spectacular, but you couldn't really see it on the screen as, you know. But again, energy wise and preparation wise, it was a piece of my preparation. Absolutely. And it just, it's that much more that you roll into that character. Yeah. So yeah. that's really cool. Kevin Leach, how can we, uh, the fans, support you? Obviously, we're going to share uh, your Instagram and Twitter information on uh, on the site. What other ways? Well, that and honestly, if if you know of a convention where there's still some, you know, Stargate love, I love attending conventions, and certainly convention organizers respond to fans' requests. So any any convention that you think that you know I'd be a fit for I'm happy to attend if I can so please consider consider that putting in a word absolutely I think that that's terrific Jacqueline this has been uh wonderful it's it's been a pleasure to finally you know have an interview that we can share with the broader audience that wow. doesn't get to sit in the cans or in on a data file somewhere Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, David. It's been great catching up with you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And, you know, all all the best endeavors going forward. Uh, I'd love to have you on again in the future. And uh, you have a good holiday and be safe. Thanks. And to you and to all the fans. Cheers. Be well. Bye-bye. Jacqueline Bye. Samuda, everyone. Near T on Stargate SG-1. Thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. Um, sorry for the... Uh, the the, the issues earlier with the uh, the video feed. I'm running on my gaming computer in the living room because if you haven't been noticing, there's been a weird hiccup, video hiccup that I'm trying to address. I think my computer's having issues with overclocking or something. So we are addressing that, let me tell you. I have fan art, near to fan art. And that is the wrong one. This is the right one. Darth Crotalis has created uh, near tea. It's Near T by Darth Crotalis, one of the gold from the television series Stargate SG-1, made with dress-up games by Doll Divine. I guess that's some kind of a software. Um, her costume was very revealing in Metamorphosis, and this just enhances it as far as I'm concerned. It acts, accentuates certain things, shall we say. The costumes in the franchise were just absolutely extraordinary. 
and, uh, and this is a great piece of art that that shows that off all the same. Before we uh, let you go, we have a sponsor. Dial the Gate has partnered with 3D Tech Pro for the month of December to give you a chance to get your very own desktop Stargate and customized ancient keychain. To enter to win these items, you need to use a desktop or laptop computer and visit dialthegate.com. Scroll down to submit trivia questions. Your trivia will be used or may be used. I keep saying that. Your trivia may be used. Never any guarantees, but it may be used in a future episode of Dial the Gate, either for our monthly trivia night or for a special guest to ask me in a round of trivia. There are three slots for trivia, one easy, one medium, and one hard. Only one needs to be filled in, but you're more than welcome to submit up to three. And please note the submission form does not currently work on mobile devices. Your trivia must be received before January 1st, 2021. I'll take it also day of as well. If you're the lucky winner, I will be notifying you via your email right after the start of the new year to get your address and what word you want for your ancient keychain. And be sure to check out our partner's website for more Stargate-related merchandise at 3dtech.pro. I have a few questions that have been set aside for me. I'm going to run through those real quick. I apologize. I've... um, a lot of these have been built over this uh, past uh, few hours with David and Jacqueline, so I haven't really had a chance to go through them yet. Uh, Yusufiel, have you, you had anyone from Sanctuary and Travelers on yet? Uh, Paul McGillian, you know, a few of uh, anyone who has been in Stargate uh, and San- who has also been in Sanctuary and Travelers, there's a there's a chance that some of these Stargate stars certainly have been. I know that uh, Paul had his his role as uh, Wexford in Sanctuary. And uh, uh, I had Tom Macbeth on a few uh, couple months back. He was he had a role in a couple of episodes of Travelers as well. There's definitely some crossover, shall we say? If you haven't had a chance to see Travelers, I think it's still available on Netflix. It's an extraordinary uh, three seasons ended way too soon, but it is essentially the full thir- uh, first act of uh, that story. I think uh, it 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 is a cliffhanger, but it isn't. So it's it's still worth watching. Um, Kevin Leach, any chance of another Stargate role-playing session? I think it's about time. I'm going to approach the guys in January and see about making it happen again because everyone had so much fun the last time around. I think it, I think it may be, uh, may be time to do that. So, R. Radev, when do you plan on showing us all your amazing Stargate props? So, the, let's let the channel get a little bit older and then I'll take you around the house and I'll show you the Stargate props. That, that's definitely... That's that's a little bit further off, but for sure. Regarding the David Hewlett stream, Watcher 652 vids need to put the link to this stream from the previous live stream. Some people didn't know how to find the stream or who David Reed was talking about. The link was already known when I go to Dial the Gates channel list. Update the info in the description. Uh, yes, I will definitely do that. Claire Burr, has David Blue been approached for an interview? I have asked David and I didn't get a response. Uh, if any of you are in touch with him and you'd love to have him show on the show, please reach out. I would I would kill to have him on. Uh, we get along like a house on fire. He's a great guy. Uh, Redux Q. It would be fitting that the last episode of your season of Dial the Gate would be an interview of yourself getting to learn about your favorite interviewer. Ex- your experience. I I you know I I think I talk enough. <laughs> And I don't know if we're going to do seasons. We'll see. I have it in such a way that I take one week, you know, off a month. Uh, we're going to keep on going as long as we can. I'm sure at some point I'll take a break. I don't have it in, in sight for the time being. Um, I, I schedule any time I go out of town well enough in advance that I'm able to, to set up uh, episodes for while I'm gone. Because I think it's important that y'all have uh, 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 content. So... And several fans have asked for a tour of David's props collection. We'll, we'll tour the props. I promise in 2021, we will absolutely tour the props. Okay. Thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. I uh, really appreciate your patience while we've worked out uh, the bugs with the transitions and and uh, uh, everything else uh, uh, this week. It's, uh, it's not been normal for what I uh, intend the quality of the show to be. So I appreciate you, uh, you bearing with me, but uh, we're just going to go ahead and, and keep on doing the program, keep on doing uh, uh, more episodes and we'll just keep on moving forward. So I appreciate your patience. The guest announcements for next week. I didn't create a graphic for that, but for uh, this coming uh, weekend, 
we are going to have uh, Gary Jones' second fan interview. He's going to interview a daddy-daughter combination at 11 a.m. on December the 27th. At 1 p.m. Pacific time, December the 27th, part two of our interview with Robert C. Cooper. It is two hours long. And it's good. He goes into heroes in depth and directing in depth. Rob is just a vast wealth of knowledge. So at 1 p.m. Pacific time, Rob will be on uh, pre-recorded. I only his his schedule is such a way that I only manage to get him for pre-recorded shows, and we're thankful to have him one way or another. Then uh, at 3 p.m. Pacific time, I may move this to 3:15 because Rob runs a little long. So check YouTube, uh, the Stargate Superfan panel. So uh, we have on uh, the majority of the Stargate superfans that MGM brought in at the beginning of 2019 to help us out with uh, uh, production uh, when we were mo- still moving forward with uh, Stargate content uh, when my team was still at the studio. We're not obviously not there now, um, but it's a great group of people, a, a great group of folks that I, uh, I love very much, and I uh, think that you're going to enjoy hearing some of their stories. Some of them are very poignant. That's all I've got for you this week. Thanks so much for tuning in, everyone. I really appreciate you being out there and enjoying the show. Let's uh, do everything that we can to bring uh, Stargate back for a fourth round. My name is David Reed. We'll see you on the other side.